wanted to do experimentation. So when he came and he saw what we were doing, he stayed about an hour or so and then he left because he found out that he wasn't going to learn much from us. And we weren't going to learn a lot from him. But another guy was Larry Nelson from Iowa. And Larry, uh, he lived in a, in a little farmhouse up in Iowa with an outside uh, uh, restroom. And uh, on the way to the restroom was the burn barrel because they always put the burn barrel, you know, you didn't, you didn't put your trash site, recycle it like we do today. They put it in a burn barrel and burned it up. And so on the way out to the burn barrel, uh, that, that was on the way to the outhouse. And then there also was the wood pile, so that when you went out to the outhouse, you'd feel guilty about not coming back with some firewood or burning the trash. So what he did is he went to the outhouse, and when he came back, he noticed that his old overalls were in that burn barrel, and his wife had burned them up. And she hated those overalls because they were getting so old and torn. And he noticed that in the pocket, there was a piece of flint. He was an arrowhead maker. And then that, that piece of flint had turned color. It got kind of red. And uh, he took a hammer stone and he hit it and it broke open much easier than the raw flint. And he went, wow. And he was one of the people in 1953 that wrote up uh, a dissertation on heat treating. Heat treating flint and changing the molecular structure. He ended up getting uh, electron scan microscopes and having that done at pretty, pretty amazing little report. So he was a world of knowledge. The other guy was Arrowhead Fred Berlin Bollinger from Cape Girardeau, Missouri. He's a one-arm flint knacker. He has a birth defect and his arm is gone here. He's got two little fingers on it. He takes a magic marker and marks eyes on his arm and tells the kids that that's Oscar and Oscar holds his flint and makes the kids feel um, a little more comfortable. But he's one of the best flint knappers in the, in the uh, United States. Uh, he's been flint napping for about 42 years. I've been at it for about 33. So Fred was a world of knowledge. He was one of the nicest guys, and he became a, a great flint napper. We all adored him. Uh, a couple other ones, Charlie Lasker. He's gone now, but Charlie was, was just learning flint napping. He was getting into it. And then we had Eric Rademacher, who never picked up a rock again. So sometimes this is for some people. For many people, it's not for. It's just that what if, if you want to get into this heavy, you can. If you don't, you can just drop it like a hot potato. Now, flint napping is just one of the experimental archaeology things that, that I do. Uh, and what, what we have in the experimental archaeology. Oh, get my mouth too close to the mic. Okay, so what I'm going to do is break up a couple flakes for you. And I've been, I'm going to use a white-tailed deer antler. Heaviest part is it comes out of the skull of the deer. I've got a piece of Missouri flint here. And I'm going to drive off a flake with that. I've got it set up at a 45 degree angle from the imaginary center line. Right there is where I'm going to hit. I'm going to hit it nice and hard. Got a lousy flake. There we go. Those flakes run toward the center. And this allows me to thin this piece down. When I'm flint napping, I want it thin because it has to be thin enough to get between joints. So when you're butchering an animal and you're going to be cutting in between joints to break open bones and to cut leaders, you need something that's thick enough to withstand torque when you twist it, but it also has to be thin enough to get down in there and cut those things. So what you need to do is take a piece this thick and thin it down to about that thick. So it still has enough strength in the middle, and yet it's sharp enough on the edge, and that's what this does. Now lately, I've been practicing, I've been learning from other flint knappers, and I've started using uh, hammer stones. And this is a soft hammer stone. We don't have these in Missouri very much. But the soft hammer stone takes a, a different type of percussion. What you do is you hold the hammer stone at about a 45 degree angle as you hit that 45 degree angle. The good thing about it is it's also a grinder. When you hit this flint, if you hit it when it's dull or when it's sharp, it's just going to give way. That's just a super sharp edge. But if you dull it first and then smack it, you can drive off your flint toward the center. So these flakes are done simply by hitting with soft hammer. If you use a steel hammer, you'll get flakes, but they won't run toward the center and thin it out. So the idea is to use a soft hammer and drive off flakes that will then thin the piece out. Once you get it thin enough, then you will come back and do pressure flaking. That's what these tools are for. This is the tying off of the end of the hammer, and the arcade people up to about, well, 
almost all the times we can use this. But when they start getting copper, then they start making copper tools. Uh, they, they have copper from about 6,000 BC. So once they get fine copper, it's a little easier to maintain. You don't have to keep sharpening it. So it's very handy to use. When you drive off these flakes, uh, you make a few uh, things happen. 